Welcome everybody to Tom and James. It is Friday and what a week we have going on. We have this incredible uh, peace deal that has been taking place in uh, Washington, the signing of it, the Abrahamic Accords. Um, we're going to be getting into that because it looks like a lot more is going to happen there. Uh, and James, I have some other things I want to talk about too. Uh, I, I got to bring this up. Uh, here's a list of things. We got the fires with smoke reaching all the way to the East Coast. We have hurricanes. We have lies and deceptions at an incredible rate. We have what appears to be the world falling into some kind of grand delusion over just about everything. Uh, the Bible speaks of in the last days, perilous times will come. I believe that was Paul writing to Timothy. Uh, we have times where Jesus said the nations would be perplexed wondering what in the world is going on. And you look at this and start putting it into context. James, you and I both live in California. There's smoke everywhere reaching the East Coast. But I look at this, President Trump challenges Governor Newsom, and he says, look, this isn't because of climate change. This is because of your lousy policies regarding forestry. And, and, and so I want you to think, I want you to comment on this. Let's look, think back to the book of Exodus. Book of Exodus, Moses goes before Pharaoh. It, two judgments, turning the, the water into blood and the uh, frog judgment. And so, so, so Moses, he's with Aaron and this whole thing happens. The water turns to blood. Pharaoh goes, oh yeah, watch what my magicians can do. The remaining water, he, he turns it into blood. And then... Uh, with the frogs, he goes, oh, yeah, so you can, you can create all these frogs to bring great judgment? Guess what? We can create even more frogs, a greater judgment. And it looks to me that's what happens with the policies of men. It's like we have disaster with, the, with certain policies regarding the environment. We worship the environment. We have disastrous policies, and it's like the leaders of the world are saying, oh, yeah, well, we're just going to bring more disaster by implementing more of these bad policies. That's exactly what Pharaoh did in the time of judgment in the Old Testament. You look now, you go, this stuff is just nuts. It's also nuts to see all of these things converging at the same time. Tom, this is really interesting. You know, it, it, forgive me for saying this, but what we're seeing right now in California, and I know that some people will look at me and go, what? Well, Truth be told, there's nothing new under the sun. I mean, th think this through for just a minute. The reason why the fire seems so extreme to us right now, and they really are, they're probably worse than they've been in a very, very long time, is because of the extended media coverage. Um, mm -hmm. And um, we have the technology that allows us to see things in real time and so on and so forth. So this is normal. This is something to be expected. However, what is more and beyond normal is understanding the fallacies of man when they continue to worship something and how man's pattern of worshiping things turns into something so destructive. And I can give you a great example of this. And, and this is, um, uh, per it's funny that you would mention the time of Pharaoh and what had happened with Moses. There are some great examples in the Bible and it would appear as though we just haven't learned our lesson. And, and um, you know, call this some biblical analysis with respect to the fires in California, but let's just talk about this for one second. Let's rewind back to the time of Pharaoh. Let's go back to when Moses goes to the Pharaoh and says, let my people go, thus saith the Lord. You've watched the movie, right? And, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so what ends up happening, and this is pretty extraordinary, is God begins to set forth a series of plagues to kind of like, hey, wake up, Egyptians, right? And it's funny because some of the plagues that came came as a result of the wicked and evil practices of the Egyptian people. I can give you an example of this. God says, okay, well, you like to worship frogs, you Egyptians. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, let's go give you a plague of frogs. So the, mm -hmm. the, the frogs come, and then notice this. The Pharaoh says, enough is enough. I don't want these frogs. These frogs are a problem for me. Oh, my gosh, I want nothing to do with them. And so God says, okay, no problem, and all the frogs die. But what do they do with the frogs? They throw the frogs in heaps. They put them in heaps. And because they worship these frogs, they wouldn't burn them like yeah. they were supposed to. They didn't properly dispose of them like they were supposed to. They wouldn't bury them or anything. They just simply put them in heaps. Well, in the massive heaps that are uh, all over town, what begins to happen? You disgusting. begin to have these maggots come in and all that. And then, and then you have the insane amounts of flies that come forth, right? Because they put things in heaps. 
And it's amazing how God really does these things. You see, they detested, absolutely detested flies, but they worship the frogs. So God says, you want to worship the frogs? Well, what you detest is going to come right to you because you chose to worship it. Now, look at what they've been doing. Newsom's failure to deal with these piles of wood that have been, you know, heaping up these old, uh, mm -hmm. old trees that have broken down and left in piles. That's a direct result of these pantheistic, new age, earth loving, uh, climate changes coming people who are basically saying we shouldn't be touching those trees. Let's let it be part of the natural ecosystem and so on and so forth. Well, you just allowed the proverbial pile of frogs to heap up. And guess what? Now you're eating the flies that you so hated. So the fire has now come as a result of man's desire to worship nature to a point where they won't do what they need to do in order to be able to survive and be safe. It's the same kind of concept. And this happens again and again and again and again and again. Mm -hmm. And people tell me all the time, what kind of a twisted God would render some kind of a twisted judgment with all these flies going in people's crotches and you know all this kind of stuff that you were reading about in, in the Old Testament? Well, that wasn't God who did that. That was, I mean, he allowed that to happen. He put that into motion, certainly, but that was a direct result of the fools that chose to worship these frogs and let them heap up. It's the same thing. We literally brought this upon ourselves. And, um, and I say we because we voted that knucklehead yeah. into office. Yeah, we voted, we voted people into office. Uh, we've gotten the leaders that we've deserved overall. I, I didn't vote for him. You didn't vote for him. No. But, heck but no. the masses of people did. And then you look at what we have in the entertainment industry, NFL, NBA, MLB, and you start looking across the board, and you watch these and, and cities. They're all self-destructing at the same time. Romans chapter 1 uh, talks about the creation, worshiping the creation rather than the creator, uh, worshiping the environment rather than worshiping God, which is where we are as a society. And the policies enacted are proof of that. And God even says, professing to be wise, I'll show them to be fools. And that appears to be what is happening. And we're watching it with the fires. We're watching it with entertainment industry. We're watching it with the cities. Oh, yeah, we're destroying our cities. Guess what? We're going to defund even more police. It, it, I don't know if you heard about this, James, but this article says... Senator Ed Markey calls to ban all police, all police, from using weapons of war and tear gas. You look, you go, it's just these constant decisions that, that keep coming our way. Yeah, and these fools don't learn their lesson. What a bunch of arrogant, cocky fools. And those same fools are the same ones that are hiring these private security firms yeah. that will deploy anything, anything that's available to them. You know, whether it be their guns, whether it be their uh, tear gas, whether it be their OC pepper spray, no matter what it is, they'll deploy anything. And these fools that continue to make up these rules have no problem. And this is, listen, forgive me for saying this, but this really is the nature of the hard left. What they like to do is they like to treat your neighborhood and my neighborhood as their toilets. They come in and they defecate all over the place and then they walk away because they know they won't have to live in that area. Yeah. And it's the same thing. I mean, you look at Pelosi and all these other knuckleheads in California. What are they doing? They're allowing people in San Francisco to destroy the city of San Francisco. Why do they care? They're living in some completely walled, gated community that's above everything else and they're not affected by it. They have their own security guards you know i mean she's probably got security guards standing around her while she's eating her half a million dollar ice cream yeah. you know what i'm talking about mm -hmm. but that's the point it's the hypocrisy of these people if these people were mandated to live under the conditions that they were creating they would never create those conditions mm -hmm. it's that simple and we saw evidence of it again with um with Nancy Pelosi, who has ordered everybody in the in the house, don't go back, don't don't go back to Washington, don't bargain, don't do anything. We're not going to talk to the president about helping the American people <laughs> for a single thing. Yet I'm going to go to this woman's salon, 
which by the way, that I've hypocritically ordered to be shut down and I'm going to use the special influence that I have to get in, you know, prance around. You can see it, you know, a little guy prancing around that's taking care of her and she doesn't have her mask on. She's got, you know, whatever slippers and whatever. She's running around her little personal spa. And then when she gets held into account, what does she say? She says, I got set up. She doesn't say I did wrong. Yeah. She says, I got set up. And then mm -hmm. tries to destroy the woman who actually mm -hmm. owns the business. Why does she care? She doesn't care if she dismantles something. It's not her own personal life that she's yeah. dismantling. It's not her own personal thing. And that is the type of contempt that I feel and continue to see with these hypocrites. And yeah. it's the same thing that's going on with the race relations that are happening in this country. These Black Lives Matter people, they don't give a rip about a black person. They could care less. They've never cared less. These pastors that are teaching critical race theory by the stands that they're taking, they're so blind by the Marxist and wicked philosophies of this world that they're bringing the church into something completely satanic. And that's the, the true thing. And it's that, that's what's really what it's become. It's the people who are saying we're wanting to preserve and defend the climate. They're the ones that are destroying the climate. You know, Joe Biden, case in point, he's going to, you know, give another, uh, he wants to do this Green New Deal, this $100 trillion deal. That's money we don't even have. The world doesn't even yeah. have that money. But he wants to, he wants to do that yet the other day. Matter of fact, I think it was this morning, this morning or yesterday, there's a picture of him wheels up while he's walking into his private yeah. jet that yeah. nobody else is in and the entourage of jets that are following him from his campaign. Yeah. Talk about uh, hypocrisy. Yeah. The hypocrisy is, is just off the charts. So you start looking at all of these things and it's, it's really an awful thing. Uh, when I get back to the thought of defunding the police, it's more destruction that's going to come. I have to think that that part of this must be intentional. And I wonder if what's happening with the police is the left actually wants to bring in their own police. Because there's most cops, pretty much all of my talk to anyways, they want what's good, they want what's right, they want to do a good job, they want to keep us safe. Now they want to, they, they want to resign. Uh, they don't want to be in that business because they know they could end up being in prison for being wrongly accused of anything or their life just absolutely ruined. So, you know, looking at this, I think the intent from the left is to actually get the cops out of here so they can bring in their own police force who will enforce some of these unbelievable laws that are going to continue to come our way. <laughs> It's a great way of putting it. I mean, you took the words out of my mouth. There's not much I can really add to that. It's absolutely true. And I think that it's disgusting because these police officers continue to give their lives for us every single day. In my opinion, they should be the best paid people in our uh, society. They should be the ones that get first preferential treatment for virtually anything because they're the ones that stick their necks out on the line. They're the ones that are running towards a gunfire when everybody else is running away from the gunfire. These are the people that continue to put their lives on the line for all of us. And yet it's it's becoming a, a literal societal crime to say that they're the best of the best. Shame on these people that come against our law enforcement officers. You know, it's the anti-racist people that are the most racist people. They're the ones that oh, are pro, yeah. you know, protesting in the name of anti-racism. Well, they are the most racist. The anti-fascists, oh. they are the epitome of fascism. Yeah. It's uh, the doublespeak. Uh, right? The George Orwell doublespeak. Oh, perfect. And perfect that's what's, description. Yeah, that's what's really taking place. I'm not the racist. You're the racist. I look at some of these policies. I was talking with our friend Don Perkins about this just a, uh, about a week or so ago. And Don, being a black man, I'm talking with him and his wife, uh, Marie, about it. And I said, you know, it seems to me, Don, I said, maybe I'm wrong, but it seems to me it's, re it's even much more racist to go to a black person and say, uh, you need the white person's help. You need the white person's help to write for you. You need the white person's, look, let us take care of this because you can't do it. To me, that is racist. And then we see what Biden did this week, trying to uh, pander to the Hispanic community in America. <sighs> did you see that? He pulled out the phone uh, at, at the end of his, his spiel and, it, and plays, that, plays that song. And you're looking going, who, you know, when you start pandering to people like this, I mean, this is so racist. You're, you're, you are acknowledging uh, that, that the whole issue that uh, what's really going on by your pandering, you're just proving more racism.
Oh my goodness. And I, I, I don't even get me started on that nonsense. But let me just simply say, especially with the garbage of this critical race theory thinking and all the other nonsense that's happening. Listen, any of you guys that mean well and believe in white privilege, you are the epitome of white supremacy. Okay, forgive me for saying that. But the epitome of white supremacy is somebody who believes in white privilege. And I'll tell you why. If you believe in the premise of white privilege, you believe in the idea that by default, because of the color of your skin, you are superior to that who is black. You have privilege based on the color of your skin, which means you are superior. That is a tenant of white supremacy. And thus, you are a white supremacist. And that's really the reality of it. Because if you deny this idea of white privilege and you understand we have American privilege, and that's all of us, right? Then everything changes then everything changes. But then if that happens and we believe the truth, well, the Democrats have no platform to run on yeah. because now they have nothing to dismantle in their mind. Yeah. So they got that going on. And then you got the climate change narrative that is just going to yeah. continue to come. So it's all your fault if you don't go along with climate change. By the way, I've even read that the smoke as it's reaching the East Coast is going to affect farm produce coming up in the future, which no doubt... Instead of being blamed on policies of of the left in forestry, bad bad policies, environmental policies, again, even the lack of uh, uh, the farm problems that are going to come are going to be blamed on climate change. James, I want to get into this uh, for the last segment of our program. Uh, you've talked a lot about it. I have too, both of us separately and a little bit together. The, we have the UAE in Bahrain, and I was able to tell everybody just the other day on my update that you had said Bahrain was going to be next. And then I was watching one of your one of your posts that you did, and sure enough, you said, I told you this was coming. And you also mentioned a bunch of other territories that we're going to. I got, a, I got an email uh, just this morning from someone who said, what are some of these other countries that are going to line up? And I also want to talk about why. And I want to ask you this. Why is it that the left absolutely refuses to acknowledge anything about this. All they could say when the deal was signed the other day on the, on, the, on the front lawn of the White House was, look, they're not social distancing. If Obama or Biden had done this, they would have been king of the it world. Been a huge part. Uh, oh, right. it would have been absolutely right. unbelievable. We'd right. never hear the end of how wonderful it was. You look at this, look, they're not social distancing. So I know I gave you a lot of questions there. The right. first one, what other countries do you see going on with this? Uh, virtually everybody in the Gulf. Um, I, I would not be surprised if we saw everybody that was in the Gulf region or a good amount of people in the Gulf region. I think probably next is going to be Qatar, um, which the implications of that are, are pretty incredible. Um, if it's not Qatar, it will definitely be Saudi Arabia. I think Saudi Arabia will probably, uh, within the next three or four countries, if not the next one, will be coming in on this. Um, I don't think they're going to wait too long. Um, I also think that there, when that happens, you'll see many other nations begin to make considerations. And I will, I will even go as far as to say this, don't be surprised. Do not be surprised if you see nations like Libya begin to really double think their position on things, even though they're in the midst of a massive civil war. And depending on who wins that civil war might depend on whether or not they go into this. Here's the problem that a lot of people just don't see. And there's, there's a lot of unique things tied to the, the, the really what I call the paradigm shift in policy that took place, starting with Donald Trump's uh, way of thinking concerning the Middle East. And he really deserves a lot more credit than people think, okay? You gotta go back, you gotta hit the rewind button. If you wanna provide any kind of analysis to this, you've gotta hit the rewind button and you've gotta go back to Barack Hussein Obama. You gotta go back to that guy, okay? Now, you gotta keep in mind what this guy does is puts together the worst deal that's ever been made in that region, and that's the deal with Iran, okay? They called it a peace deal. It really wasn't. It was, uh, let me just make you happy so that we can keep the international community's mouth shut long enough to give you the power that you need so that you can go to the table as a nuclear uh, power. And so basically they said, okay, they're going to sign this deal. John Kerry gets on, hey, there's a wonderful deal. And was, I'm not even going to go there. It's, I, <laughs> I, yeah, I always get myself in trouble when I imitate that fake. Anyway, he, he brags about it. Obama is bragging about it. Then they make, it, they make the deal even sweeter to Iran by doing 
perhaps one of the worst things that anybody could ever do. And what do they do? They take 150 plus billion dollars and they give it in cash, United States currency, and they give it. I mean, this is plain. This has to be three or four 747s full. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about cargo jets full of cash and they give it to them, which basically is responsible. The single greatest um, uh, fiscal injection into the cause of violent extremism in the region. Okay. You can go back and you can trace hundreds and thousands of attacks that have happened in that region to that 150 yeah. to 180 billion dollar injection that he gives. So he does all that. Okay. Then we vote for Trump. Praise God. We vote for Trump. Trump represents a completely different uh, way of thinking in the Middle East. Matter of fact, they say that his Middle East policy is going to be horrible. He has no idea how to deal with world affairs. He's a fool, so on and so forth. Well, he basically, forgive me for saying this, just wiped them all out. He, he went in there and he completely owned the whole world by doing what he did. He goes, we, we hit the rewind button. We go to July of 2017. July of 2017, he sits really has a sit down in the Middle East with 50 of the most prominent Middle East leaders in the world, in that region, okay? Saudi Arabia is there, Dubai is there, uh, the UAE is there, and they're all there, okay? Qatar is there, they're all there. Every single one of them, they're all there. And he basically says this, he says, I, make, I, wanna, I want you to know two things. Number one, I am wholeheartedly committed to stand with you against Iran, and I'm wholeheartedly with you to stand against violent Islamic terror. Now, everybody in that region has been threatened by Iran. They're more scared of Iran than they ever will be of Israel. They're more scared of Iran than anybody else. And there's several reasons for that. Number one, there are idealistic differences that are represented by the Sunni versus the Shia. The Shiites basically are the Iranians. They roughly are about 4.5% of all of Muslim, all of Islam. And everybody else surrounding them, they're the Sunni. They're, they're the Sunni. They're the majority, Okay. So you have that issue. And of course, they're a nuclear power. And the reason why they're scared, that, well, Israel's a much more determined nuclear power. They actually have nuclear weapons and so on and so forth. Why aren't they more scared of Israel? Because they know Israel isn't going to go bombs away when Israel wants to. They know that Iran absolutely will. They know that Iran, without a doubt, will fire away at a solid, at any nation that they want to with a nuclear weapon the very moment that they have it. That's why they are so scared of Iran. So they respected him. Now, here's the other thing that he did, that uh, President Trump did, that was brilliant. He dismantled the Iranian deal. Once he dismantled that deal and then started throwing sanctions at them, he began to bring them to their knees. Now, there's a lot to say about that, but let me just suffice it to say, Iran, China, Russia, and many other nations desperately want Trump to lose this election. You want to know why? Because if Trump loses this election, Iran wins. They go back to doing what they were doing because Joe Biden, Sleepy Joe, will go back and give them whatever they want as yeah. long as his own personal pockets are lined. That's exactly what's going on. The reason why Iran has not given up and said, okay, we'll make a deal with you, a real deal involving real monitors and real people to fix the thing is because they want to wait until the election. They want to make sure that Trump is going to be out of office because if Trump is in office, eh, they lose. They can't hold out for another four years. There's no way. And within four years, our Mideast policy will have already been so solidified by the, by, the, uh, by the addition of many of these other nations. Good luck. It isn't going to happen. Now, the other thing that we have to keep in mind with all of this, and this is why every Christian on the face of the, of the planet portion of the United States of America needs to vote for President and Trump. That's, I'm sorry, but you do. We have to. Okay. Here's the other thing that we should also be talking about when it, when it relates to this. President Trump was a genius. He started this whole process by going to the Palestinians first. He went to the Palestinians and he said, I believe in a two-state solution and we should have a two-state solution. Now, does he really believe in one? Heck no, he doesn't believe in one. It's obvious he doesn't believe in one. But he knew that the Palestinians would be so stubborn about it that it would begin to turn the hearts of everybody else. And he called it. He manipulated it perfectly. He went to the Palestinians. He said, look, this deal is going to start with you. Let's 
let's, let's work on a two-state solution. They said, phooey, get lost. We don't want to talk to you. No way. The only two-state solution we'll accept is a one-state solution, and it won't involve Israel. Death to the Jews. We want this place back, even though it was never their place in the first place. So Trump goes to all these other leaders that he's already had, that he already has a very, very good relationship with based on the proclamation that he makes in 2017. And he says, guys, I've been working tirelessly with the Palestinians and they want nothing to do with me. So here's my deal. I'm, I'm still going to open the door. The door is going to be there, but I want you guys to start working with me. And you know what they said? Rightly so. They said, Yep. Yeah. I, now, in the speeches, they'll say, oh, we're looking forward to a two-deal, two-state deal or whatever, but they don't give a rip. They just signaled those guys, you know what, we're not going to wait for you guys anymore. If, you know, enough, of, enough is enough. And in the private conversations, that's what everybody's saying. Even the liberal media that is in the Middle East is beginning to say, well, the Palestinians don't want to come to the table, so this is the better thing for us to do economically speaking anyway. This is the better relationship, and let's go ahead and have peace. Now, you take that a step further and you bring it out to its complete fruition now these guys are at the table there will be more that will come to the table the royal family in saudi arabia i promise you they're going to acquiesce if qatar doesn't do it first if qatar doesn't do it first and saudi arabia will they will come into the picture and they will do it and i will tell you this i, I can i can say this with great confidence Everything that the president has done is literally miraculous. There is no way in the world this would have happened had it not been for the Lord intervening and doing this. Now, I want to say a word to some of the people that are saying, well, we shouldn't vote for the president because this deal that he made is detrimental to Israel because Israel is giving up land in order for this to happen. Lie, lie, lie. You guys are listening to fake news. Go read the deal, okay? The deal specifically, the specific stipulation with respect to land in the deal is very simple. It is, we are not going to stop the annexation process. We are going to delay the annexation process. That could mean delay it for five days, or that could mean delay it for five months. It does not require Israel to concede to stopping the process of annexation of any of the land uh, entities. So keep in mind, no one loses here. This is basically a game of bragging rights. This is the UAE saying, see, we're even giving you more concessions, Palestinians, to do what you want because we've got the annexation of land stopped so that you can make a deal. But if you don't want to make the deal, we're not going to stop them from annexing the land because... Plain and simple, you didn't want to come to the table. And that's exactly what's going to happen. And Netanyahu, if the other party lets him and they stop you know, being ridiculous about things, he's going to go back and he's going to proceed with the land annexation. And in doing so, Israel's going to be a bigger winner than everybody else. And this fits right into Ezekiel 38 and 39 because the reason why these invading nations come into Israel is for no other reason. It has nothing to do with cultural idealism. It has nothing to do with any type type of geopolitical disagreement or anything like that. It is, we want what y'all got and we're going to come take it. And that's exactly what happens. So it has nothing to do with anything else. And these nations seem to be on a relatively friendly trajectory with Israel. At least Russia does. So this is, this is incredible as we see it. It's all coming together and it makes sense. It makes perfect sense. Okay. So we, you see these Arab nations joining into the Abraham Accord. Uh, right. Now, let me ask you, you mentioned Libya. Uh, let me ask you, Libya, Sudan, Russia, yep. um, Turkey, Iran, could you imagine any of them entering into, well, you mentioned Libya already, any of the rest, could you imagine them entering into a peace agreement? I had that question the other day. I gave my opinion on an email. I'd like to hear what you have to say. Because we My look at guess, that, I look at that with Ezekiel thirty-eight and thirty-nine in context. Yeah. So uh, my guess is probably not. Um, it, it's kind of difficult to say. Uh, is it possible? Uh, could it happen? Um, well, I can tell you this: there are certain nations that are listed there that I think will likely happen. Okay. For example. Uh, my guess is the Sudan might jump into something like this. Uh, Oman might jump into something like this. Saudi Arabia might jump into something like this. Uh, Morocco, this is, a, this is a nation that a lot of people don't think about, but they might do it simply because of economics, right? Mm -hmm. But do I see Turkey jumping into something like this? If they did, they'd be one of the last nations. Okay, I, would, I could see it as being... Uh, some of them entering, in, my answer was very similar to yours, 
it was, you know, I thought it was a good question. I said, I don't really see it happening, but it's quite possible that in Ezekiel 38, as Israel's dwelling in peace and safety, it could be not just these Arab communities that they've got these uh, the Abraham Accord with, but it could be they've uh, that Russia and some of the other countries have entered into an agreement with Israel, in a sense, giving Israel, guaranteeing them their peace, that would cause Israel to really lay down their, their uh, worries of threats. Because what's implied in Ezekiel 38 is that is when they are attacked. So I said, hey, it's possible. I don't think so. I do see, I, it wouldn't surprise me at all if Putin did, but uh, mm -hmm. I'd have a hard time with Iran and Turkey thinking that they would because uh, they're both so vocal against Israel. It, it, it would, it, and, uh, you know. But I don't think Trump would allow Putin to step into it, and I don't think that Putin would do it. I think Putin, the way that he is and the mindset that he has, if he enters into any type of a treaty with Israel, it's going to be some kind of an economic deal. It, I, I don't think it's going to be a peace treaty in the sense that Israel and Russia have always seemed to have a, an amicable relationship. We're not talking about, you know, we're we're not talking about, hey, they're they, let's be best friends and mm -hmm. and let's that kind of a thing. But I think it would be it would be something that would come in the form of some some type of an economic type of an agreement, some sort of a trade agreement, yeah. something like that, I think is Makes what we would see. Sense. Definitely a pipeline, some kind of a pipeline yeah. agreement you'd probably see, especially from yeah. the Mediterranean. I could I could definitely see that. And, uh, you know, Israel, I could definitely see Israel letting their guard down with Russia a little bit more. As you said, they're amicable in their relationship. But if, if uh, given an economic reason to enter into an agreement, I would think right. Israel would think, well, why would Russia come against us? Well, because they want what you have and they want to take it, according to Ezekiel 38. So, And can I make you this promise? I, huh? I, will, I will go on record in saying this. I will go on record in saying that if Kuwait jumps into this, which I believe they will, if Kuwait actually says we want in on this deal, then Russia will almost immediately seek to make some kind of an economic deal with Israel. Because if Kuwait jumps into this, then I can promise you that there will be some oil uh, issues that exist now between these nations. The face of OPEC, by the way, is going to completely change, especially because of the fact that Israel, whether or not anybody wants to admit it, is energy independent, right? So any type of a deal that Russia would want to enter into with Israel very likely would not involve wanting any of Israel's natural resources, but it may involve potentially a pipeline or some kind of a modified land bridge, especially connecting resources from places like Kuwait into Russia. And this is going to come into play with some of the arguments that are going on with China and so on and so forth. Like I said, this represents a huge paradigm shift in the, in the, um, uh, political and geo, uh, or the geopolitical imp implications of everything related to the United States' policy with respect to this, because what this, in e what this in essence is going to be doing is this is taking these nations and sending them on their own trajectories to create a deal uh, very similar to the uh, trade agreements that Trump has been setting up. This is exactly what's going to go on. This is going to be based on economic increase economic benefit and by the way that's that's the same kind of thing that i think the eu is going towards that's the direction of the consolidation of the eu and everything that's happening in the eu it all goes back to economic considerations that's really what it is a lot of people spend time talking about geopolitical analysis but a majority of that analysis is going to go back to economics yeah. it's just really it's it's truly amazing to watch all of this tra uh, uh, transform everything that right. we've seen and uh, to hear the news in America uh, wouldn't give any attention to to any of this happening and the only news report I really heard out of America over the this past few days has been look at what Trump has done these poor Palestinians how he's just devastated them that's all they could say yeah. but you look at the pretty much the entire Arab world is looking at this just uh, saying look, we need this. This is great. And yep. this has never happened before yep. in the history of the world, yet it, it, it shouldn't surprise us too much when we look at the Bible. Uh, some of the details do. I mean, I couldn't have imagined this coming together exactly like this, but we know these peace agreements were going to happen in the last days. are only going to increase, and we know that confirmation of a peace deal is coming. The Antichrist is going to confirm a peace deal. That is not these things. Last word on that, James, 
Uh, in fact, before I have you answer that last nice face, before that last oh. word, <laughs> I got to ask you this. Uh, how can people get a hold of you? Oh, uh, you can follow me on Instagram. So that's uh, at James Cadiz. You can, uh, we would love for you to uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, Calvary Chapel Signal Hill. And uh, you can also go to our, um, we also have Twitter and uh, um, Facebook, and you can go to at Calvary Chapel Signal Hill, or I think it's Calvary Chapel Signal Hill. You can do a search and you'll find us pretty, pretty quickly. Let me just say this on the record before we move on. Um, if I were to put an order behind these nations, I would probably say Qatar or Saudi Arabia first. And then a quick second after that would probably be Saudi Arabia. If not, Kuwait's jumping in. And then after Kuwait, we'll see Saudi Arabia. Depending on how the peace deal goes or the agreement goes uh, with Iraq and Afghanistan and some of the things that are happening there, we might end up seeing them jumping in on this as well. So I just wanted to say that before things move, but I wouldn't be surprised if that was the case. And yeah. so I, that's why I wanted to just make that statement and go on record because I know you, you asked me and I, I just brought up my list that I had written down and I just started thinking about it a little bit more and I'm thinking that's probably the order that it's going to be. Really amazing. Uh, Naftali on his Instagram posted yesterday, I don't know if you know who he is, he's out of Israel, says five or six Arab countries to join peace agreement with Israel, which is basically what you just said. You named them. But uh, this is not, and, and just the very last thing. Oh, by the way, I'd like you to subscribe to my YouTube channel Please. too. That would be, <laughs> that'd be nice. Also my Instagram and, and uh, Facebook uh, and even Parler with me. And then, uh, but uh, uh, this is not, the anti, Trump is not antichrist. And I get that all the time. Look at, no, you know, he's not. this is not it. Antichrist confirms a covenant that's already in place. Maybe this will be the covenant. We don't know. There's been several over the years. This could be it, and Antichrist will come along later and confirm it. And uh, am I right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I Second knew I Thessalonians was. I knew you were going to say it. Yeah. tells us that. It makes us very clear. Uh, we won't see who the Antichrist is until... Uh, we are raptured as the church. Daniel 9.27 tells us that the covenant is going to be confirmed uh, by the Antichrist. And that is when the tribulation is really going to start. Yeah. yeah. In fact, we should talk about that next week because there are so many people that are convinced that we will see Antichrist. That would be a great <laughs> conversation. Let's save that for next week. Well, Thank if we you, see James. Him, we'll see him from heaven. So <laughs> There we go. <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for your time today. This has been fantastic. Have a great weekend, and I will be talking to you very soon. All right, bro. God bless you.